mostly? Yeah, hi. Um, I am just about uh, between five and ten blocks north of the actual site of where those two towers have come down. We're obviously having a bit of trouble right now maintaining our location because we just heard one more explosion. That's about the fourth one we've heard. The police are telling us they're either car bombs or they are uh, simply cars that have overheated so much that they're exploding. But every time one of those happens, there's a flurry of activity and there are more emergency vehicles that come down this road. I don't know if you can shoot past me and shoot down into that black cloud in there. That is the cloud that we were in just uh, about 45 minutes ago or so. At the time we were there, when the, f when the first trade tower came down, my producer and I were uh, overcome by the cloud of debris and smoke that came at us so rapidly. We had to break down a window to, a, to an apartment building. We had to break the window and, and, and go into the second door inside just to breathe. We were followed by a police officer and a security guard from the World Trade Center area. I want to show you something if I can. I'm just using a cell phone so that I can hear you because there are no cell lines that are coming out of um, Manhattan at the time. But see if you can zero in on this right here. This is the kind of debris that we're seeing all over the ground. If you can see the address, One World Trade Center, Trade Center, Trade Center, Trade Center, Trade Center. Okay, obviously we're having some technical problems with Ashley Banfield, who is on the ground near the World Trade Center about five blocks away. All right, here's the first confirmation from United Airlines. It's confirmed one of its flights crashed in the Pittsburgh area. Flight 93, a Boeing 757, a flight involved originating in Newark. It was bound for San Francisco. No information on how many people were on board. A 757 carries a lot of folks. Uh, anyone who's flown from Newark to San Francisco knows that most of those flights carry uh, a full load. Okay, so this now brings to three the number of confirmed flights that have been involved in this tragic day. American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles, Flight 77 from Washington Dulles Airport to Los Angeles with 58 passengers on board and now the United flight, Tom, that you just mentioned. And, and you can say that we have to say that the, the number of passengers was relatively low on those first flights and, and we can only hope this was not a full flight, this United flight. You know, there was a collapse, obviously, not just of intelligence, but of airport security as well, that that many planes were hijacked almost simultaneously. Although uh, these days, as we know, Tom, and, and learned from the TWA tragedy, Flight 800, that oftentimes some of these devices are absolutely, uh, it's impossible to see them in, in our kind of uh, security x-ray machines that you have at typical airports. Some are made of plastics. They can be very small and virtually undetectable, which is, of course, another major problem for airport security. We're going to go to Bob Bazell, who is at St. Vincent's Hospital. Obviously, we're... Uh, very concerned about the people who were in the World Trade Center when these two planes crashed into them. Bob, tell me about the scene at St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, Katie, the wounded are starting to come in with great regularity now. Almost every 30 seconds an ambulance pulls up. Some of them are very badly burned. Some are dead. I've seen uh, several dead bodies go in. Cardinal Egan, the head of the Catholic Archdiocese, is standing out on the street uh, giving last rites. He said, may God help us many times over. There's been a call out for blood uh, from all the New York hospitals. People are lined up around the block. People have responded in enormous numbers uh, to that. Everybody seems to want to help in some way. New York has become kind of surrealistic on the streets above lower Manhattan because all the subways and commuter lines and bridges and tunnels have been shut down. So many people who are, are not injured are wandering around aimlessly. But in the hospitals, there's so many injured coming in now that they don't have run out of gurneys and they brought every office chair that they have down and put sheets over that to carry people in. It's an enormous amount of work for all the staff. Uh, people have come in, uh, everybody who was off has been come in. Calls have gone out for specialists, for plastic surgeons, for burn specialists, and it's going to be a very grueling uh, several days ahead. Well, uh, Bob, the other thing is that I don't know whether you can tell about traffic in the rest of Manhattan because a lot of our major hospitals are well north of there, Lenox Hill, Columbia Presbyterian, New York Cornell, are the ambulances able to get through if they cleared the traffic? We're in kind of a tomb here in the studios in Midtown. Tom, I, have, I had trouble hearing you just that time. Uh, the, there's a system in place here where there's triaging people down in lower Manhattan. They're putting uh, sometimes tags around their neck to show some people you see wandering up from lower Manhattan who have only slight injuries who have been cleared. Others are very seriously injured. Every hospital in the area is involved in, the, in a plan to take in some kind of patients. This one where I'm at, uh, St. Vincent's, is one of the closest with a uh, major trauma center. But every hospital is on alert. Every hospital is just taking in what is becoming now a sea of patients. 
All right, NBC's Robert Bazell. Bob, thanks very much. Let's go back to Washington and NBC's Tim Russert, who has a guest on the phone, Porter Goss, the head of the House Intelligence Committee. Tim? Exactly right. Uh, Congressman Goss, are you there? I'm here, Tim. As the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, what is your official reaction to what we witnessed this morning? Well, obviously, I'm horrified. Uh, we, uh, we do our best to make sure there are no surprises like this happening to Americans at home or abroad. Uh, it's never 100 percent sure, and we got the wake-up call again today. Uh, it is uh, unbelievable that anybody would do an act like this, basically using uh, innocent victims aboard our commercial airliners as weapons uh, against other innocent victims in our uh, big buildings, our symbols of uh, economy and commerce in New York. and. Um, our defense and legislative and executive buildings here in Washington. When people are watching this at home, Congressman, they're saying to themselves, how could this happen in the United States of America? A complete breakdown in our airport security, a complete breakdown in our airspace security over the Pentagon, uh, the center of our military command. How could something be this vulnerable? Well, we are a free, open, democratic society, and we take great pride in that. Uh, we pay a price for it. Uh, we, as you know, if you've ever flown into Washington National, Washington Reagan Airport, you fly right over the Pentagon. And many times we've commented on uh, how vulnerable the building is for just that reason. Uh, that vulnerability was taken advantage of today. Uh, as for uh, commercial airliners flying around New York and airspace there, uh, obviously they fly near the trade towers. To be able to say that our airport security works 100%, uh, anybody who flies in America knows that's not true. You answer a few questions before you get on the plane and show a photo ID. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't do mayhem on the plane, as we see from time to time. And tragically, uh, some kind of an organization somewhere has orchestrated all this in an effective fashion. We have great intelligence capabilities out there who keep us constantly on alert about these types of reports. Uh, I can tell you, I know of no specific reporting uh, anything of this particular specificity on this day uh, with these targets, but I can tell you that we are scrambling all the time to assess uh, information that would do harm to the United States and its people. Uh, and as we know, we've, we've seen uh, our, our military installations subject to attack, our embassy subject to attack uh, before. Uh, we stop a lot of it, but obviously uh, we don't get it all, and uh, we're just going to have to rethink how we do business in today's world and deal with these kinds of threats. Based on your experience as a honored CIA agent and now as a very res highly respected chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, how many organizations, terrorist organizations in the world, are capable of pulling off such a coordinated massive attack? Uh, I would say there's only a handful if we're not talking about state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, if you're talking state-sponsored, it, it could be more, but I don't think we're dealing with state-sponsored. I think we're dealing here with a loose network, a loose, asso loose association of people who have the same goal, which is an anti-United States goal, who have found a way to get together and, and network and, uh, and pull this thing off. Uh, part of the problem uh, with terrorism is that one of the weapons of terrorism is confusion. And one of the hopes now, of course, of the terrorists who perpetrated this is that we will uh, have lots of confusion, uh, in the United States, and there will be rumors of other things happening, and that will upset uh, how we go about our business and our behavior and how our law enforcement people react and so forth. That's one thing to deal with. And another thing to deal with, as the president alluded to this morning in his very strong statement, was that we will respond. The question is, against whom? And we want to make absolutely sure when we're dealing with asymmetrical warfare such as this, where we're dealing with innocent people, by and large, who are victims of this, that we respond appropriately and uh, not uh, provoke any other incidents uh, that are unwarranted in the world, but get the people who actually cause this to happen. And that requires good information, and obviously we're in the process of trying to get that information. But it may take some time to yes, sort through, through all this, find the fingerprints, and in fact launch any kind of retaliation. That's, that is certainly true, and one of the hallmarks we may need is patience these days. Congressman Porter Goss, Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, we thank you very much. We'll be contacting you throughout the day, and we very much appreciate you joining us this morning. Well, thank you. I have my prayers to the others. Thank you much. Back to you, Matt. All right, Tim, thank you very much. We're going to talk to uh, someone here in the studio in a second, but, Tom, you've got a phone number for people who are concerned about passengers on board those flights. American Airlines has confirmed uh, that two of its uh, flights were hijacked, and for people who want to know, the number is 1-800-245-0999. Uh, United headquarters, you may not be able to get through, obviously, is 847-700-5538. United has confirmed that one of its planes went down near 
Pittsburgh, American has said that two of its planes were involved in the hijackings today, one from Dulles and one from Boston. Right, and apparently a United Airlines was involved, is right? It, right. right. And I said that in Pittsburgh. Okay, right, yeah. from Newark en route to San Francisco, right. was that right? Yeah, Ron and Sana is here. Oh, actually, we're we going to go, go first to Ashley that, We're going to go downtown again. Ron and Sana, oh, no, okay, we're going to... There we go. Okay. Ashley Banfield well, we're has someone she's talking to. We're giving out emergency numbers over the, over the airways. No, 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 I know, but we're doing that now. Yes, that's the only thing. I just Come wanted to ask Ashley, you. Ashley, can you hear me? For emergency personnel, either law enforcement or medical. Do you know anything about those extra no, explosions we heard? No, I do not. Were they car bombs? I have no idea, ma'am. Are you being told that we're going to have to move out of this area as well? I was not told anything relative to that. What about the sewers? Are they looking for bombs in sewers? Non-essential personnel. That's okay. All I can tell you. Okay. Thank obviously, you, sir. Uh, the emergency workers are moving people out of that area. Ron and Sana is here with us in the studio. Ron, obviously, you were downtown at some point because we see you have uh, basically soot and debris in your hair and on your jacket. What happened? Well, uh, one of the MSNBC cameramen and I were trying to get across the street, having uh, driven down to try to cover the event, uh, obviously, for, for NBC. And uh, as we were going across the street, we were not terribly far from the World Trade Center building, the South Tower. As we were cutting across in, 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 in a a quarantine zone actually the building began to disintegrate and we heard it and looked up and started to see elements of the building come down and we ran and honestly it was like a scene out of independence day everything began to rain down it was pitch black around us as the the winds were whipping through the corridors in lower manhattan i ducked around a corner got into a car which was open and it was it was nighttime for several minutes before was, things was this cleared the up the first tower that collapsed? i believe it was the first tower that collapsed this was the south tower and uh, as it was coming down what, what that looks like there is mild compared to what it was like to be at the center. It was pitch black for blocks. And was it smoke as well as dust? It was smoke, it was dust. I assume it was part, part of the building coming down, in, in a, just pieces of, of a disintegrating building coming down as well. Obviously, we're very concerned about the triage unit that was set up there to help people who were trying to get out of the building, Ron, to help people who had already been carried out of the building and who were being treated medically. Uh, were you close enough to survey the scene at, at I was the within about a building? half a block of the building as it started to come down. Can you tell us what you saw it there? It was fairly clear. Uh, there were some areas along the street that did have uh, blood and debris. There were no longer people in the area except for a couple of uh, journalists and police officers who were uh, quarantining uh, the, containing the area so people wouldn't cut through. And once it, once it did begin to clear after that several minutes of pitch darkness, what did you see in the streets then? Uh, it was a very deep gray smoke. It was, it was, it honestly looked like a bit of a nuclear winter, the type of thing you see in the movies with, with ash all over the ground on top of cars, on police cars, on windows. Uh, I made my way into a building because of the one light I could see and uh, stayed there until a couple of police officers and a few of the people inside the building were able to get into a vehicle. We picked up a few injured people along the way and dropped them off at the hospital. You did. What were their injuries? Well, one policeman was, was, had a deep gash in his forehead. Uh, he, was, he was all right. He was clearly you know, a bit shocked, and the young lady had shrapnel in her arm. Uh, don't know what, what it was, uh, whether it was part of a building or, or glass from another building. Was there a lot of peripheral damage to other buildings and, and, and stores Not really. in the area? Because when that building came down, one would only imagine all the pieces of steel and concrete that came cascading down as yeah. well and hit other places. I imagine the collateral damage was enormous, uh, but we were probably, I'd say, two or three blocks away in a building where we holed up for a time until we were fairly comfortable that it was safe to come out. Uh, but. Uh, it was truly the, the most intense and frightening experience I've ever had in my life. It was literally pitch black uh, on the street, and uh, people were, you know, obviously inhaling a great deal of this material as well. So there are many folks who are having difficulty breathing and were wearing facial masks as well. Oh, we're happy you're all All right, we have uh, uh, United Airlines confirms that uh, United Flight 175 from Boston to Los Angeles is down as well. No details yet. It's confirmed that flight uh, 93, we believe, from Newark to San Francisco is down. No details as yet. That's the one that we think went down in the Pittsburgh area. I wish that we could be more specific. Um, the information is, as you might expect, pretty uh, chaotic. Uh, but there have been at least four airliners that have been hijacked today. And, and Tom, we're, there's going to be an awful lot of scrutiny on the security in Boston at Logan Airport because it now two appears that two of these flights originated there. And somehow, someone managed to get on these planes and hijack them. Well, this is um, this is an event, uh, Ron. We're we're happy to see you. And uh, <laughs> thank you. You have no idea how happy I am to be yeah, here. Yeah, it is a relief. But then you think about uh, the experiences of thousands of other people who yeah. are down there in the epicenter of all that, and were there when it occurred. Our hearts go out to them. We don't know what the